So that guy's weird tie in the back, and if you can hear me, then I'm, we're okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we don't have much time, and, um, and uh, there's so much to say. This presentation is not going to help your digestion. <laughs> so... I didn't make the program. I would have done the music and then gone into me lightly. Uh, can everybody see this or should we turn off another couple lights here, maybe? Huh? Okay. Well, <clears throat> I'm, the, uh, I'm not the spiritual part of the program. I'm, I'm the political part. Um, and... Uh, I'm not the Christian part, I'm the Jewish part, and I'm not the American part, I'm the Israeli part. <laughs> so, categorize me correctly. What I'd like to do this evening is, uh, is really two things, or three things, but I, I'm going to try to do it really quick, just on, on one foot, as Hillel would say, because we don't, we don't have any time for questions or discussions or anything, unfortunately. But <clears throat> I want to kind of give you an overview of, of the conflict from the ground up. You know, I'm, a, I'm an anthropologist. So anthropologists always look at the world from the ground up. Everything, is, uh, everything people say is nonsense. Everything governments say is certainly nonsense. And treaties and declarations and this and that. You've got to see what's happening on the ground. What an anthropologist asks, the basic question of anthropology is, what in the hell is going on here? <laughs> and that's only a question you can know if you're there, and you see on the ground what intentions are. And that's the basis of my approach. That's the grounded analysis um, uh, that I have. So I want to kind of give an overview. I also want to bring you in a little bit into house demolitions, into the wall, so you see a little bit yourselves about what the realities are, and then to try to talk for a minute or two about where we are and where we could be going. It's a kind of a big agenda for a little amount of time. Um, we have to start with this. This is the part of the Israeli framing, or the Israeli, pr um, where Israel is coming from that is not discussed, it's not articulated. And it can't be articulated, and it can't be articulated by non-Jews. And that's, in a sense, uh, the, uh, the privilege I have of being Jewish and Israeli. I can say things that, that you can't say. Uh, <clears throat> we have to understand this issue of exclusivity if we're going to understand anything about, about Israel. And I, I can't, it's hard to put it in, in a nutshell, but let me just say this. When nationalism began to emerge in the 18th and 19th centuries, modern European nationalism, there were two major streams. One was the nationalism of Western Europe that, of course, became the nationalism of the United States. Jefferson, Franklin, a lot of the founding fathers spent time in France and so on. Uh, the French Revolution, it was a kind of civil nationalism. The United States is a Western democracy from the point of view that the concept is that the United States belongs to its citizens. It belongs to its people, all of its people, and everyone's equal. And you can be a citizen, you can be an immigrant, you can become an American. You can become an American. Now, we all know there's racism and discrimination. We know that, on, that it's not always exactly like that when we're building a wall. You're building a wall on the Mexican border, but nevertheless, nevertheless, that's the conception. The other major form of nationalism in the 19th century was in Eastern Europe, Eastern and actually Central Europe, pan-Slavism, pan-Germanism, that, that was completely different. It was a tribal nationalism. The idea was, for example, in Russia, Poland, Serbia, and so on, that a country belongs to a particular tribe, particular people. Russia belonged to the Russians. 
Until today, even though Putin kind of goes through the facade of a democratic election, you don't really have the concept of a citizenship or a civil society in Russia to, until today. So that, so that the idea is that Russia belongs to the Russians. Jews lived a thousand years in Russia and were never considered Russians. You know, because that's the way that that part of the world was, uh, was uh, constructed. And, and so when Jewish nationalism began towards the end of the 19th century, the Jews, the Zionist movement, and uh, also Herzl, who was a part of sort of the pan-Germanic tribalism, took that tribal organic form of nationalism as the nationalism of Zionism. It wasn't an American nationalism or a French or a British. It was very much Eastern and Central European and brought it to, to Palestine. And, and you know, it makes sense. 90% of the Jews in the 19th century lived in Russia. So they're not going to jump, when they start to think about their national identity, they're not going to jump to a Jeffersonian type of democracy. They took the, the major form of nationalism in that part of the world, which was a tribal one. And therefore, like in Russia today, or Serbia, or Poland, or those other, the other countries, the concept behind Israel is that the land of Israel, we call this entire country, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River, the land of Israel. We don't use the term the state of Israel very often. We talk about Haaretz. If you ask somebody, where are you from? You say, where are you from in the land? It's a very broad concept. And over its entire history, Israel has resisted having borders. Because the idea is that we're in a, a political process of reclaiming our historical land. The land has more meaning for Israelis, I would say, than the state. And uh, certainly for the settlers, but for, for many Israelis. So the concept is the land of Israel belongs. It belongs exclusively to the Jewish people. And this you'll find on every three bumper stickers in Israel. The land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. That's one of the most common phrases. It's even a phrase that the Jewish agency uses. So that this is the essential concept. If this country does not belong to its inhabitants, it does not belong to its citizens, it belongs to the Jewish people. It's what we call in Hebrew a Jewish democracy in Israel. And therefore, the other side of the coin is that Arabs, now I use the word Arabs purposefully. In Israel, we don't use the word Palestinian very often. We talk about Arabs in a very undifferentiated way because to say Palestinian gives too much recognition, distinctiveness, and legitimacy to another national group that we deny exists. We cannot accept the idea that there's another nation, another people in our country, in the land of Israel, that has national rights of self-determination, that has legitimate claims. Now, we know there's a bunch of Arabs in the country. I mean, that we can, we're not blind. We can see there's Arabs in the country. <laughs> but they don't add up to a people. We never talk about the Palestinian people. And as much as everybody's upset that Hamas does not recognize Israel, Israel has never, ever, ever recognized the existence of a Palestinian people or its rights of self-determination, not even in the brightest days of Oslo. And therefore, the, 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 the other side of the coin of this, of this framing is that Zionists reside in our country by sufferance and not by right. They have no right to be in our country. They can stay there if they shut up and they don't raise their heads, to use the biblical phrase, and, and they're not uppity and they know their place. They, they, they can stay there. But if they do, if they do have the chutzpah to challenge our exclusive claim to the country, we can expel them, we can kill them, we can do anything we want to. There is, there is no concept of another side. In a conflict, you need two sides. I might hate the other side, but there's another side. In our conflict, there is no other side. 
This is us. It's all unilateral. Everything is unilateral. It has to be because we have nothing to talk about. We're dealing with people in our country, and we decide if, if they're going to get land and how much land they're going to get, or if they leave the country or stay in the country or, or whatever. What I'm saying is that this is unspoken because Israel tries to present itself as a Western democracy. And if this was actually articulated, not only would it create a lot of dissonance between the image of Israel as a Western democracy and the reality, but I think most Jews would say, whoa, wait a minute, that's Israel? That's the country that, that I claim to, uh, to be a part of? Most Jews, I believe, and certainly in the United States, the Jewish community here is defined by its commitment to social rights and human rights and social justice and equality would, would absolutely reject this. But this doesn't come from the United States. This comes out of Eastern Europe. And this is very much a part, rather than a democracy, you can look at Israel as an ethnocracy. It's a country that privileges one particular ethnic national religious group over all the others. So with that understanding then, it's, Israel is in the process, we're not in a conflict, we're in the process of reclaiming our country, our national homeland. So if you think about it, I mean, there's no occupation. Israel denies officially, the government denies officially that there's an occupation, because you can't occupy your own country. So you can imagine trying to have a political discussion with Israelis where there's no Palestinians, there's no occupation, and there's no conflict. <laughs> what are you left with? You're left with terrorism. And so everything boils down to terrorism, which is very convenient because then we cast ourselves as the victims. We're the victims of terrorism. They're the bad guys. And there is no occupation in the entire Israeli discourse. You will never, ever, ever hear an Israeli spokesperson uh, use the O word. They won't, they won't do it. And they can't do it because uh, Israeli policy explicitly says there is no occupation. So that if we're in the process unilaterally of reclaiming our land, what are we doing? I talk about a matrix of control that, uh, that Israel has laid over the occupied ter territories in order to foreclose forever a viable Palestinian state and in order basically that Israel uh, uh, control the entire country forever to make, it, to make the occupation immune from any pressures, whether they're external pressures or internal pressures, to, uh, to achieve a just peace with the Palestinians, the whole conflict really boils down to land. And Israel claims the land exclusively for itself. So the first element in the matrix of control is, uh, is the, the confining of the Palestinian population to what we call areas A and B. 90-some percent of the Palestinians in the occupied territories, especially the West Bank, live in areas A and B. I won't go into all the detail, which makes up 42% of the West Bank. So the West Bank and Gaza, the occupied territories, are an area the size of the state of Delaware, with about six to seven times the population of Delaware. Now imagine six times the population of Delaware locked into 42% of Delaware, which isn't the largest state. It's probably the size of the ranch in Crawford, Texas. You know. <laughs> All right, that was. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> at any rate, Imagine all those people locked into 42% of, 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 of uh, Delaware, but not a contiguous 42%. The Palestinians are locked into more than 70 islands. Areas A and B are more than 70 islands, and you need a military permit in most cases to pass from island to island. So add that to the equation. In Delaware, five to six, seven times the population living on 42% of the land and then carved into, into 70 islands. And that's 
and, and that's uh, the life of the Palestinians with area C. You see all the, uh, all the gray area, you see all the blue splotches, those are the settlements. There are between three and four hundred settlements already in the occupied territories. There are more than, there are almost a half a million settlers living in the occupied territories. So that, uh, so that what I'm, wh one of the things we have to keep in mind, not only is there an occupation, but it's a proactive occupation. This is not motivated by security. You can't explain almost any element of the Israeli occupation by security. Not, Israel did not build three to four hundred settlements because of security. It built them because out of a proactive claim to the country. It didn't demolish 14,000 Palestinian houses because of security. The, the people were never charged with anything. That they weren't security-related uh, uh, demolitions. They didn't uproot a million olive and fruit trees. A million olive and fruit trees in the occupied territories since 67 because of security. The highway system, I'll show you in a minute, was not built there because of security. These are all proactive elements that, and, I, and we have to stress that in order to put the burden of the responsibility on Israel. I reject the symmetry. I reject the both sides thing. I don't think the Palestinians are free of responsibility, but, but they're not the occupying power. There's a power differential here. One side is a state and the other side isn't. One state has a powerful army and the other side has, doesn't. And one side is the occupying power. The Palestinians are not occupying Tel Aviv. They're not building settlements in, uh, in Haifa. So that there, it is not a symmetrical situation, and there is nothing whatsoever wrong with putting the responsibility on Israel and demanding that Israel be held accountable for its actions. That's the first element. And, and this leads to house demolitions, because the problem is that most Palestinians own land. They're, the land of their farms, the land they own is in Area C that's controlled by Israel. But Israel doesn't want them to move onto that land because it wants the land for itself, for settlements and for, uh, and eventually, um, you know, that it'll be a, a next to Israel, uh, most of Area C. And therefore, the entire West Bank has been zoned as agricultural land which means that when a Palestinian comes and says, I want to build a home on my own land, Israel says, no, you can't because it's agricultural land. And of course, because we sit on all the planning committees, when you want to build a settlement, of course, then it's easy to rezone the land from agriculture to, residence, to residential. Um, but it's really a facade, a political mechanism for controlling the land and confining the Palestinians. And therefore, you have the issue of house demolitions. 14,000 Palestinian homes demolished in the occupied territory since 1967. 60% or so of the houses are demolished in military incursions, where Israel will come into Gaza until today. In the last, in the last three months, there's been more than 500 houses demolished in Gaza. So that, or the Israeli army will come into the Janine refugee camp. Um, some, you know, in reaction to something, but a completely arbitrary reaction. Hundreds of houses are destroyed of people that had nothing to do with whatever it was that provoked the army uh, to invade. But the other houses, there's thousands of other houses that are simply houses of people that want to build homes on their own land. And, and are prohibited, like the Shawamri family. Salim Shawamri was here in Kansas City with me a few years ago. So some of you might, might have met him, Arabia, and their, today there are seven children that applied four times to the civil administration, the Israeli civil administration for a building permit, and were denied each time. Each time they applied, it cost them $5,000 for fees, for, for architects, for maps, for this, for that. So it's a tremendously expensive thing, especially if you know almost that you're not going to get it. Finally, like thousands of other Palestinians, 
the family had to build a home anyway, a modest home because you have to live somewhere. He, they were living in the Shuafat refugee camp. But how, how long can you live in a room with seven kids? So the house was built. They lived in the house for five years uh, until 1998. And by the way, when they built the house, there wasn't area A, B, and C. So they, they fell into that whole trap after um, the house had been built. Nevertheless, uh, 19, July 1998, the family's having lunch, and there's a knock on the door. They have a demolition order, but you, know, you never know when they're going to come to demolish. It could be tomorrow, and it could be five years, and it could be never. So the families live in tremendous anxiety. Uh, and fear for years. One day they're having lunch, there's a knock on the door, Salim opens the door and here he finds himself confronted. Now I don't know what civil servants look like in Kansas City, <laughs> but these, to my great shame, are Israeli civil servants. These are employees of what we call the civil administration, which is Israel's military government, and in fact they're settlers. These are settlers hired by the civil administration to decide whether Palestinians can get permits and whose house is going to be demolished. And of course, they're armed, as you can see. This is Rami and this is Micha. They're well known in the whole region. The West Bank is divided into 18 regions and each one has warlords. These guys can go into your house any time of day or night if you're a Palestinian with, not, with no knock. They can just walk in. They have the authority really to do almost anything in the villages. Rami says to Salim, is this your house? Salim says, yes, it's my house. He says, no, it isn't. It's our house now. We're gonna, we've got 15 minutes to get all your belongings out, and we're going to demolish it. So what do you do? I mean, is it, it's not a normal human reaction to say, uh, dear, would you please help me carry the dining room table out? <laughs> what do you do? You protest, you yell, you argue, and if it gets too loud, or if by chance you touch one of these guys, it turns into resistance, and immediately that triggers a military response. They're shooting. This day they were shooting. One 16-year-old uh, kid lost... Uh, his kidney and part of his stomach, there's tear gas, and Salim finds himself uh, uh, beaten and thrown out of the house. His wife uh, locked the door, tear gas was thrown in, and the family was flushed out. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this quickly because we just don't have time. And then when the family is finally out of the house, um, all right, when, when the family's out and the furniture is thrown out, then the bulldozer comes to demolish the home. And here there's, tr there's, you know, there's tragedies and tragedies and tragedies. The driver of the bulldozer is a Palestinian. You know, he's just a guy that works for this company. You know, it's a commercial wrecking company or commercial company that the civil administration subcontracts to. He got a contract to demolish Palestinian homes. And so one day the driver reports to work and the boss says, the Israeli boss says, you're going to go build a road over here. The next day he reports to work and the guy says, we have a permit, you're going to go demolish houses. Now, it's very easy for us to say he should say no, but you know, if you're a Palestinian, it's not so easy to say no and lose your job. And so, and so, and it turned out that he knew Salim. And this driver himself was from a village that had been demolished in 1948. And Salim is lying on the ground. He has no idea where his kids are. His wife was, was, went into shock and was taken to the hospital. And you know, I, I, you know, and you watch your house being demolished. I mean, if anything is sacred, if we're in some, some discourse here about sacred things, what about a person's house? And what was his crime? He's not a terrorist. He was never charged with that. He's a perfectly nice guy that was here in Kansas City, not very political, who all he wanted to do was build a home for his family on his own land. It's not near a settlement. It's not near a road. It's not bothering anybody. So if we Israeli Jews 
And if the American Jews are going to defend Israeli policies, we have to take responsibility. This man is our victim. What is his crime? How can Jews do these kinds of things? These are the questions that the Jewish community is not asking, nor is the Israeli Jewish community asking, um, for all kinds of reasons I won't get into right now. At any rate, here was the, the furniture that was thrown out. And one thing you can see is these are Romanian foreign workers because the commercial company just hires foreign workers and they go in and they rip everything out. You know how you have a bedroom set with the, you know, things are screwed together, everything's ripped out, the papers are thrown out, everything. We resist. <laughs> You know, we try to resist the demolitions. <clears throat> we, uh, we get in front of bulldozers. We chain ourselves in houses. We try to resist, but we also try to delay to give time to, for journalists to come that we call, consulate people to call, to call. If we can make enough of a to-do, we might lose one or two houses, but we can save maybe three or four or five houses that day. And next time you think you're having a bad day in the office, here's my day in the office. But, we, but we're in a privileged position, I have to say this. As Israeli Jews, we know they're not going to beat us, they're not going to shoot us, they're not going to, they arrest us all the time, as you can see, but we're not put in jail. Um, and therefore, we're able to resist in ways that Palestinians can't. If Salim would sit in front of the bulldozer, they'd shoot him. Period. There's no questions asked. But I can do, so uh, Israeli uh, protesters, resistors, can do those things. Here's Rabbi Arik Asherman, who's getting arrested. Actually, Salim and Arabia's house was demolished four times and rebuilt by us each time. And Rabbis for Human Rights, which is an organization of 100 Israeli rabbis, are on our board and, and come out together with us to resist the demolition of, of Palestinian homes. Finally, the home is demolished. And we, if the family is willing, not every family wants to go through that trauma again. I, I don't have time to tell you how men, women, and children react differently to, to demolitions, but let me tell you, it's an entire society that's been traumatized. If you can imagine this happening, you know, we're talking about 100,000 people. To, to whom this has happened. Uh, we come out, Israelis, Palestinians, you see the people with the red hats? These are CPT people, the Christian peacemaker team uh, in Hebron, uh, internationals come, and we rebuild houses if the family is willing that have been demolished. We raise funds, uh, and, 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 uh, and we, we rebuild homes, See, here's the tent that the family was given by the Red Crescent Society to live in. And that's a very important peacemaking, peacemaking uh, effort, I think. You know, because it takes some, sometimes weeks to build a house. So it's not going out, holding up a sign, and going home. But you really have a chance, and I think it's meaningful for Israelis as well, you really have a chance to get to know Palestinians, to resist in a meaningful way, and I would say this is super meaningful because in the end, if we look back not only at the 14,000 houses, if we look at the 418 or so villages that Jonathan referred to earlier that were demolished in 1948 and after inside Israel. And you know what? Last year, the Israeli government announced the establishment of a demolition administration. Within the Ministry of Interior, there are 20 to 40,000 homes of Israeli citizens, Arab citizens, that are slated for demolition, of Bedouins, of what we call the unrecognized villages that 150,000 Israeli citizens live in until today, so that if we step back and look at the house demolition issue, we're talking about displacement dispossession. We go way beyond occupation and simply a conflict. And this is why I go back to that idea of exclusivity. 
This is the expression of what we call in Hebrew nishul, of dispossession. And so it goes uh, uh, wider than simply this particular conflict. Now the second element in the matrix of control is uh, what we call the closure. Uh, there are, you know, Palestinians cannot come into Israel today almost completely to work. Israel has, over the last 40 years, has deliberately de-developed the occupied territories. The economy is worse today by, by magnitudes than it was in 1967. There's actual starvation in the occupied territories, and it's all induced. There's absolutely no reason for it. Palestinians can't come into Israel to work. They have no economy of their own. It's a scorched earth. Israel has left a scorched earth. And, and as you can see, these, all these little dots, all these triangles, are, are checkpoints. There are actually 750 obstacles to movement between these islands. So again, imagine Delaware. With half of Delaware in 70 islands, and each island is surrounded by check posts, uh, 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 guard towers, terminals, and even in places like Jericho in particular, trenches. So you can't drive in and out. And you begin to get a sense of what's, of what's happening. The third element that's very important are what we call settlement blocks. Settlement blocks are Israel's bottom line. These pink areas are the areas that Israel wants to keep uh, in any political solution. This is the basis of what Ulmert calls his convergence plan that he presented to the American Congress, a joint session of Congress last April, in, in detail. This is the only map I know of of settlement blocks, by the way. It's a map we've done, our estimation of what they are. So here's an extremely important plan. From Israel's point of view, it ends the occupation. From our point of view, it, in, it, 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 uh, it uh, implements a plan of apartheid. An extremely important plan presented to Congress based on settlement blocks. No one has ever seen a map of the settlement blocks. No one knows what a settlement block is. The Israeli public has no idea what a settlement block is, where it is, how many there are. There, in our estimation, there are eight that Israel wants to keep. One is the Jordan Valley because it controls the border and it controls the water. And for the last eight months, the entire Jordan Valley, which is 30% of the West Bank, has been completely sealed to Palestinians. This whole area. And a city is being built in here of 50,000 people. A new settlement city is being built. So if anybody has any illusion that Israel is thinking about a two-state solution, I mean, spend 10 minutes on the ground or looking at the map, and you have to go on to other kinds of options. There's the Ariel block, which divides the West Bank east and west around the city of Ariel, and also sits atop the largest water aquifer. Israel controls 100% of the water of the Palestinians, 85% is used by Jews. 85% of the water of the West Bank is either used by the settlements or is piped into Israel. There's the Modi'in block. Here's the city of Modi'in, which straddles the Green Line, which is being built today as the largest city in Israel. And the largest settlement in the West Bank is an ultra-Orthodox community called Kiryat Sefer or Upper Modi'in. And, and there's very rich agricultural land in here. And then there are three settlement blocks that make up Greater Jerusalem. Uh, Givat Ze'ev, Ma'ale Adumim, and the Etzion block. So that Jerusalem's being transformed from a city into a region that controls the entire central portion of the West Bank. Not only will Palestinians be pretty much excluded from Jerusalem, they are today. Palestinians cannot come into Jerusalem physically, any of the Palestinians from the West Bank, not only is, Pal is Jerusalem being isolated, which has cultural, political, um, and religious, obviously, 
uh, uh, meanings. I mean, we always complain about how Jews don't have access to this or that religious site. We're preventing Muslims and Christians from praying in their churches and mosques. It's clear. Not only that, but the World Bank estimates that 40% of the Palestinian, budget, the Palestinian economy revolves around Jerusalem. That's where tourism is in particular, the largest Palestinian economy, uh, industry. So that by cutting Jerusalem out of a Palestinian state, Israel is cutting the economic heart out of any Palestinian state. A seventh settlement block is East Jerusalem itself. About 220,000 Palestinians that can't, that can't move westward, westward into the Israeli uh, section of the city, but who are, have a wall being built around them and are being isolated from Palestinian society. And finally, a, a settlement block coming from the south up to uh, the city of Hebron, the settlements in Hebron. What this does then is it carves the West Bank into what Sharon called cantons. This, Sharon was ex extremely explicit about this. There's no, you don't have to believe, it's, this isn't a, a left-wing, uh, anti-Israel, uh, whatever, telling you this. This is Sharon's plan, and anybody that knows Israeli politics uh, uh, can follow it. Sharon talked about cantons. There's a northern canton, you see the settlement blocks make up a northern canton for the Palestinians around uh, Nablus, a central canton around uh, Ramallah, a southern canton around Hebron, Jericho's hanging out there somewhere, and Gaza. And that's a Bantu stand. Because Israel, it's true what I said, that Israel claims the entire country for itself. And we will not ever, ever give up control of this country. But demographically, in order to preserve a Jewish state, some purely Jewish state, we have to have a Palestinian state. We have to get the Palestinians off our hands somehow. What do we do with almost four million Palestinians in the occupied territories? We can't transfer them out of the country, even though that's discussed all the time in Israel, in the parliament and on television. You know, but it wouldn't look good for Israel's image to put four million Palestinians on trucks and ship them to Amman. We can't do that yet. We can't, if this is one country and we're a democracy, why don't we give them citizenship? Well, ah, no, but that's the one state solution. We can't do that because then it wouldn't be a Jewish country. And we can't, we can't uh, maintain the occupation forever because the occupation itself is, is violent. It's draining our resources. Um, it, it, it can't be stabilized, normalized. So what do you do? The answer and the logic is exactly that of South Africa in the time of apartheid with Bantustans. You create a Palestinian Bantustan. In other words, a cantonized entity that, that you give to the Palestinians. And look at our language, generous offers, unilateral. It's all us, we decide. This is, there's no negotiations here. You give the Palestinians a little truncated mini-state. You get them off our hands. Now they have a state. It's a two-state solution. But we remain in control of the entire country. And in order to enforce that, we're building... All right, for, all right. first of all, just to mention, uh, I think, I, don't, I can't, I lost count of the elements, but the, another element of the matrix is, is the road system, the infrastructure. So Israel built, during the Oslo peace process, 29 major highways, Israel-only highways, that linked the settlement blocks into Israel, all financed by the United States, by your tax dollars. Now, if you can possibly uh, uh, look at this and think that Israel had any intention in the world of a viable Palestinian state emerging, then you've got, you have an imagination better than mine. And the final element in the matrix of control, of course, is the wall that's being built. Now, you can't say a wall. The, the, the ambassadors will get very uh, angry if you say a wall. It's a fence. We call it a fence. The official name, the official name is a separation barrier. Because separation, which is what apartheid means in Afrikaans, 
Separation is the name we give our policy. It's hafrada, exactly what Jonathan called it. I tend to use more the, the apartheid language. Jonathan uses the hafrada language, but I think there's certainly a dovetailing. I don't think we really disagree in our analysis. The separation barrier then defines, it's not a, sep it's not a security barrier. That's the way it's sold, of course. But if it was really a security barrier, it would follow the border of the country. If it would follow the green line, it would, Israel would not have been hauled in front of the International Court of Justice. You know, you can build a wall on the Mexican border. You know, you can do it. It's dumb, I think, but you can do it. <laughs> but, but you can't build a wall inside Mexico. You know, you can't include a good chunk of Mexico in the wall. And that's what's happening here. Look at the wall. It's not a security barrier, it's a political border that defines the Bantu stand. And you can see the logic, it's clear. It follows areas A and B, and then when it hits a settlement block, you see it goes around. This is the RAL block. Look where the wall is going. Look, that's a security barrier? No, it's a land grab. And it's a political border that defines the Bantu stand. And just to give you for a second a look at the wall, the wall is 26 feet high around the Palestinian. All the Palestinian populated areas are surrounded by the wall. 26 feet high, it's more than twice as high as the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall was, was 12 feet high. And this is seven times longer than the Berlin Wall. And it snakes through communities. You see here's ba in, in Bethlehem Beit Jala. You can see the wall constructed. You know what's missing in this picture? Israelis. Where are the Israelis? Wait a minute, this is a security barrier. Doesn't it separate Israelis from Palestinians? No. It separates Palestinians from Palestinians. Because the wall goes through areas that the Jews don't see. Jews don't like walls. We have some very negative associations with walls. <laughs> Concrete walls. And therefore this entire complex is built in a way that the Israeli public can't see it. It's built through the heart of Palestinian communities, dividing, this is a grandmother, and her grandchildren live over here, separated with a wall. Schools are separated, hospitals are separated, businesses. It goes through, completely through communities like, for example, Abu Dis, and El Azaria. El Azaria, what's El Azaria? It's Bethany in the Bible, from the Lazarus story. That was a part of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And yet it's separated today from Jerusalem by this 26-foot wall that snakes through. Again, no Israelis within miles. And you know how everybody gets upset when, you, when the idea of an academic boycott on Israeli universities is mentioned? Well, this is Al-Quds University. It has, a, it has a, as a matter of fact, there's a couple campuses of Al-Quds that have the wall built through the campus. There are faculty and students that cannot get to school. What, what is that? That's okay? And it's only Israeli universities you can't boycott? Because this is invisible to most people. And the wall goes on and on and on. And entire cities are surrounded with a wall, like Tul Karm, of 70,000 people. The wall is not linear. In the, with the Berlin Wall, you could stand on one side and walk to the Atlantic Ocean, and you could stand on the other side and walk through Russia to the Pacific Ocean. This is a complex of walls, secondary walls, tertiary walls, fences, trenches, guard towers, terminals, checkpoints, patrol roads. There are killer dogs. That, that, that patrol the, 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 the security barrier. A special breed of dog in Israel all these years resisted the use of dogs again because of their association. And there's a special breed of dog bred in Holland, I can't remember the name right now, that's especially fast, especially strong, and especially aggressive. And they're used to patrol, to patrol these kinds of barriers. So it's a deadly, if it is a fence, it is a fence, it's a deadly fence. And entire cities are surrounded, as you can see here, by the wall. Or, and 
You have to say something good. We created gated communities for Palestinians. <laughs> you know, thousands of people. It, just in Jerusalem, there are 55,000 Palestinians locked into enclaves in which that the wall absolutely and completely surrounds. And the wall, as it's being built, I mean, it, it, the humiliation, the, the interference in, 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 in everyday life, the claustrophobia, um, I, I can't begin to convey to you the meaning of this wall. And yet, Palestinians resist. They resist together with Israelis. Um, uh, physically, they resist the building of the wall. Belin is the most famous uh, a, a, a protest that's been going on for a couple of years now, but even things like graffiti. And some of the graffiti is absolutely breathtaking. Look at this. <laughs> that's something. And some of it is in your face and just political and, and, and so on. And in the rural areas, it's true, there's a fence. Why it's so important that, that you call it a fence, I don't know. I, you know, you can see through it. That's, but, you know, in terms of what it actually does, what's the difference between a fence and a wall? But, but I'm telling you, try to use the word wall sometime in a public discussion, and you'll see the reaction. The fence is an electrified fence. You can see the electrical and, and uh, you see the patrol roads, trenches, and what does this do? All this goes through olive fields. You see the olive groves here? So farmers are cut off from their fields. This can be 150 uh, yards wide at different times. So tremendous amounts of agricultural land are lost. Uh, in addition to which, the landscape is absolutely vandalized. This is the land of Israel. This is the Holy Land. It's not, with all due respect, to Minnesota. <laughs> you know? This belongs to everyone. You have a fragile biblical landscape that the Jews, in my reading of the Bible, in the covenant with Abraham, is that the Jews were supposed to be the custodians of the land. The land is absolutely being vandalized. This hill, you can repeat it a, 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 thousands of times. There's hardly a hill in the country whether inside Israel or in the West Bank, that hasn't been knocked down, cut through, or vandalized in this kind of way. It's an environmental issue that no one has ever touched. And again, gates in the rural areas. So finally, where we're going is towards the Bantustan. We use the apartheid language. And I'm very happy to hear that uh, President Carter, Jimmy Carter, is coming out with a book, as you know, called Palestine... A peace, not apartheid. And I, that's going to go a long way towards, towards generating this discussion, and I think in the end, uh, utilizing the term. And we use the term specifically, not as an allegory, not as a curse, not as a, as a slogan. It's true. First of all, it's separation of populations. Our policy is called separation. It's a demographic separation. It, it, it doesn't matter. If in South Africa it was separation on racial grounds, and, on, and in, uh, and in uh, uh, Palestine it's separation on ethnic, religious, national grounds, who cares? The point is populations are separated and there's a power differential, as Jonathan said. This is domination. This isn't separate but equal. If you had the two-state solution, the real two-state solution, it's not just... But the Palestinians have said, we can live with that. That would be separate and sort of equal. But this is obviously separate, and this is the permanent institu institutionalization of a regime of domination of one people over another. And to my horror, and I don't know for the life of me why the Jewish community isn't horrified, the fact that the Jews are becoming the Afrikaners. Building ghettos and walls. I mean, it's absolutely inconceivable to me. And yet the Jewish community stonewalls. And, uh, you know, I can speak in churches. I could never speak 
Well, that's not true. Once in a while. But almost never speak in a synagogue, certainly not in a federation, certainly not in a Hillel house on campus. And I think this, uh, the Jewish community has to do some, some soul searching as well on this issue. But here is a Bantu stand where Israel expands to 85% of the territory. Even though the Jews are only half the population today, and they'll be less than half if refugees come back. So the other half, the Palestinians, uh, uh, will get 15% of the land truncated into cantons with no border, with no water. Uh, you get to this map by looking at areas A and B. You take out the settlement blocks. You take out the line of the wall. You don't have to be a genius to figure out uh, where Israel is going. And it has to be unilateral, obviously, because you're not going to get the Palestinians to agree. And this is why we call it apartheid, because of separation and domination. And finally, we don't have time to get into this at all, but you know, where could this possibly go? We're really, we're really stuck. You know, Israel has in fact for, done what, it's, what it wanted to do for 40 years. It foreclosed any possible establishment of a viable Palestinian state, a viable state. There can be a Bantu stand, but not a viable state. Viability is crucial for the Palestinians. We have to remember two things. One is that refugees have to come back. Not all the refugees, but even a few hundred thousand is meaningful. These are people that have lived for 60 years in terrible conditions, undereducated, unemployed, unskilled, especially those in Lebanon. That's going to be a tremendous task for any government or society or country to, to accept. In addition to that, more than 60% of the Palestinians are under the age of, of 18. So that, and these are kids that are traumatized, brutalized, uh, undereducated, unskilled, with no infrastructure, there's no economy in the country. So the issue of viability is not just an academic issue. So that this leaves us with a few possibilities. The first option, which is the option that the international community adopted, that the Palestinians agreed to already in 1988, even before Oslo, and that the Arab world, the Arab League agreed to in what's called the Saudi Initiative, is a viable two-state solution. A state of Palestine in the occupied territories, all the occupied territories, alongside of Israel where Israel keeps 78% of the country. <laughs> That's the worst case scenario for a two-state solution. And Israel says no. 